When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth Shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make Shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. You are listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Ancient tools and burials. Welcome to the Archaeological Fantasies Podcast, episode 55. I'm your host, Sarah, with my co-hosts today, Ken Fader and Jeb Card. And today we're talking about the mystical face on Mars. What is it? How did it get there? Is it really alien life? Or is it just a trick of the light on Mars? Get ready to think critically. No, we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. No, we don't do dinosaurs. Rated trials as one will call. Everyone, and welcome to the Archaeological Fantasies Podcast. I am your host, Sarah, and I am joined today by both of my co hosts, Ken Fader. How's it going? It's going great. And Sarah, Jeb Card. Doing fine. And I think if we do this one more time, the, the seals of Revelation finally open. <laughs> what, have all three of us on the show? Yeah, if this is the third time, we do it again. That's for... I just have you on the show so there's someone else to talk over Ken when he's trying to say things. No, it's all good. No, I I didn't say this was a bad (laughs) thing. Like, okay, it actually actually is a terrifying thing. But anyway, no, it's great. School's begun. I have wonderful students already. Uh, The weather has been kind of awful until today, and it's gotten really nice. I'm not saying it's fall because I don't want to, like, tempt it, but... Fall cannot get here fast enough. It feels a little like fall. Oh, yeah, no. One of my one of my former students was on um, Facebook, w- uh, wondering over or being marvelled over uh, Salem and how they want to go there. And I was like, "Did I tell you about the time I was chased by somebody through the streets of Salem?" <laughs> and uh, I'm so not I, surprised and, by that, honestly. Yeah, it was actually uh, it was actually on a Lovecraft themed trip, which we will maybe talk about in the future. Maybe. So, <laughs> all right. Yeah, it's been the first first week of our semester as well, and I, I have yet to have any student raise their hand in class and ask me. The perennial question: Do we have to know this? Nah. Which is which is my least favorite question. And I yeah, respond, that's. Yeah. I respond the same way by saying, "You're an American. You do not have to know anything." And then everything has consequences. I would just tell them yes. Just every time they ask, yes, right you have to know this. It'll and then on the be, test, just have it be like one ambiguous question. It will be on the exam. That's all you need to know. <laughs> I, I gave mine a quiz. And one of my, in, in my Introduction to Archaeology, Method, and Theory, I've gotten rid of exams this year, this time. We're going with lots of quizzes. And the first one was on, did you pay attention when I talked to, about the syllabus? <laughs> it's actually a useful kind of thing. So, all right. So today... We have two topics we want to kind of hit on, and the first that Ken really is chomping at the bit to talk about (laughs) is there is apparently, just in case nobody listens to our podcast and has never read my blog and and or Ken's book, did you know that there's new evidence about the Piltdown mystery? This this actually has been bothering me for a while. It's, It's the way scientific publications, some very valuable with all kinds of interesting stuff, are framed in popular media. In order to, to generate clicks, in order to generate people reading this stuff, everything has to be framed in terms of it being groundbreaking, mm-hmm. earth shaking, um, and how we gotta, we have to go back and rewrite the, we have to rewrite the textbooks now because of this new piece of data. And the thing that's bothered me most recently is an article published online in August 10th of this year. New genetic and morphological evidence suggests a single hoax or created Create the Piltdown Man. Now that's the the, um, the title, and it's extremely interesting. And there is some new stuff, but the the fact of the matter is that this article increases or furthers our understanding of what happened to Piltdown incrementally. It is it is a a small step towards better understanding who did Piltdown, why they did it, and how they did it. But if you read the headlines that you can see here, I just brought up a series of uh, some random ones. Right. It's, we finally know forger of notorious Piltdown Man hoax. Scientists finally know who crafted Piltdown Man. Forensic examination reveals identity of Piltdown hoax prime suspect. But here's the deal. In each case, what they're, who they're referring to is Charles Dawson. But 
here's the deal. If you read anything about Piltdown Man, about the, the, the that hoax, uh, published in the last few decades, Charles Dawson always floats to the top of the suspect list. May, may I just break in? I yeah, must break sure. in for a second. What is the now discarded Latin scientific name for uh, Piltdown Man? Eoanthropus Dawsoni. I wonder why it's Dawsoni. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, exactly. Well, you know that, that Dawson actually had some other fossils named after him. I mean, this guy was a regular at, at scientific meetings, a kind of a person on the fringes who was always walking around and, and either finding stuff himself or encouraging farmers or construction workers to give him strange um, curiosities, which he then um, brought to scientists and got credit for those discoveries. But the deal is this this article is it's very interesting. There's some DNA analysis. Uh, uh, the list of things that, that are presented in popular media is brand new. Number one, we now know that the mandible of the Piltdown Man, um, in the Piltdown Man cranium, was an orangutan. And yes, it actually is true that this article seals that, confirms that with DNA, uh, DNA evidence. But you know, almost since the 1920s, the suggestion was made that the mandible, in fact, belonged to an orangutan. I was going to say, none not, of this sounds new. This is not, it, well, it isn't new. It is new in the sense that we now have definitive DNA evidence. But morphologically, from almost the outset, I mean, even folks who accepted the, 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 um, the reality of this, that this was a real thing, they looked at the mandible and said, wow, that mandible looks very simian. It looks like an orangutan's mandible. Now, they didn't put those two, those things together, put two and two together and say, well, maybe it actually is an orangutan mandible. Uh, there no, were actually were. some people that did. They, I mean, they got they got yeah. overruled, but yeah. Uh, right, right. Oh, no, that was I, – I, and, and there is something to be said for the fact that it was British scientists who by and large embraced Piltdown for various reasons and that it were people out, off of – you know, outside of Great Britain who were a little bit more skeptical – and yes, absolutely, uh, there were folks who said that, man, yeah, that mandible doesn't look right. In fact, uh, the one part of the mandible, the mandible, is, it's, a, it's a half mandible. It's, it's half of it. And the condyle is broken where it would have articulated with the base of the skull. Which is very convenient. And, well, in fact, there were people at the time who noted that and, and said, oh my goodness, it's, it's amazing how lucky we have been in having that <laughs> one piece of the mandible that could have confirmed the legitimacy of the connection between the mandible and the cranium, that providence was not looking down kindly upon us when that part of the mandible broke. Well, obviously, the, the hoaxer understood that that was a real problem, that if that condyle had been there, it would have been obvious that the, the two pieces didn't belong, that the base of the cranium and the, and the base of the skull and the mandible didn't belong together, so they broke it off. It was obvious, rather obvious. So we, we always knew will say with 99% certainty that it was an orangutan mandible. Now we know with 100% certainty. So that's good. That's an important thing to know. But when you have popular media saying well, they had no idea what the mandible was, but now we know it's an orangutan. Um, the other thing that was that's really interesting um, is the fact that, and this is a theme throughout, and this actually is in the article, that we now know there was only one person involved, Charles Dawson. And I think their argument is really weak because essentially what they're saying is, well, the MO, the, the MO at both Piltdown 1 and Piltdown 2, which of course was discovered by Dawson again, and that Dawson never revealed where that actually was, uh, the idea is that the, the MO is so similar in both places that it must have been one single hoaxer. And I don't get th that rationale. I don't get that argument. If, in fact, Dawson worked together with somebody else, and there are a long list of names of folks who have been accused of being the, the co-conspirator with Dawson, that if somebody had worked with him, why would we expect there not to be a consistency in what the specimens looked like both at Piltdown 1 and at Piltdown 2? Mm. It seems to me if they did a good job, it would look very consistent. Yeah. Right. I, think what they're, I think what they're arguing is there's not two independent of each other hoaxes but that's not what right. they're saying no it's not really and or, or that's if it is, the problem means, or if they are they're saying it very poor that's how i read it because yeah, there had oh, been no. pierre what, who is it pierre Thiel de chardin, de chardin yeah. yeah who had been accused of hoaxing 
And some people had suggested that maybe he had hoaxed separately, which is just weird. Right. Yeah. 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 So I guess that, but that's, yes, this is very fascinating stuff, but yeah, it is being misrepresented. Yeah. Stephen Jay Gould wrote um, a, a piece for Natural History Magazine in which he supported the claim that it was Teilhard de Chardin. And I actually, at some point, I sent Gould a copy of my Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries book with a chapter about Piltdown in there. And I sent him a copy and I said, you know, you, you in term, as a scientist and as a writer, you are absolutely, you are uh, my hero. And he, the funny thing is Stephen Jay Gould apparently went immediately to the index, looked for his name in there. <laughs> and he effectively told me that he did that. And he wrote me back saying, well, thank you very much for your kind words. But rather than be your hero, I wish you had taken more seriously my claim that my my assertion that Teilhard de Chardin had been involved. So he apparently thought very that 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 was in fact um, a a well supported hypothesis. Ultimately, all it's about is that Teilhard de Chardin kind of misremembered stuff towards the end of his life in terms yeah. of the sequence of things. And so, you know, so so much of it is based on just the fact that he misremembered the order in which things occurred and therefore he was accused of well he couldn't have known that when he now says he did so therefore he must have been in on the hoax but arthur smith woodward who, who was there for, for a few years digging with dawson he's the guy who dawson first alerted uh to the, the, the to the site um he's been accused and arthur conan doyle has been accused simply because he's in the area and was pissed off at, at scientists, one of his beliefs in, in um, spiritualism. But the Telegraph from UK has said that Conan Doyle is cleared. So the, the he is no longer a suspect, may yeah. I, I, mean, I may I, I say. I think that the accusation of Conan Doyle was just, was purely a kind of, well, this is a, this would be a cool possibility. Yeah. Maybe it was the guy who did Sherlock Holmes. Even in the articles that I've read that have proposed this, they, the authors themselves admit, themselves admit, well, there isn't any evidence for this. Yeah, that's, there's, that's there's just a weird no, one. But, but wouldn't it have been cool if Conan Doyle did it? And so to now say, ah, oh, he's been exonerated. When I read this, when they say we definitely have proven, they, they have definitely proven that Charles Dawson was responsible. To me, it's like somebody saying, coming out and saying, well, a new article proves absolutely that John Wilkes Booth uh, assassinated uh, Abraham Lincoln. And that, so the mystery is solved. Well, well the, this the, is something we've already hmm. known. Well, the academic article, like the, the source of oh, the yeah. tooth and all that, that's really cool because it, it is Absolutely. nice to have more evidence to show the connection and, and that will come – and, you know, when you're actually solving a mystery, it's these little bits of, of stuff that will later be collated right. that are really useful. But I, I feel you on this, Ken. I think it was – was it was it the Chris Hurst uh, interview where I was all mean about Tuankamun's meteoric dagger? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yes, and that was, was that one. It was the exact same thing because I have literally been showing for years in class that, holy crap, King Tut had a meteoric dagger made of the, you know, they thought of the bones of the gods because they thought that's what meteoric iron was. Right. Because it's obviously meteoric iron. So a paper went and proved beyond a shadow of a doubt, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That is meteoric iron. But everybody freaked the hell out. About like, oh my god, he's got like extraterrestrial meteoric dagger. And I'm like, but we all knew that. It's, it's the thing that, and I think I mentioned this when, when we were talking to uh, Chris too. It's, we need to be reminded periodically, especially in today's modern society, which has such a short attention span and memory. We need to be reminded of things periodically. The Piltdown Man one though, I don't know. I just, it's, it. Okay, great. That we know that the tooth came from the mandible. That's cool, I guess. But I mean, it, there's no doubt that this thing has never been real. Right. There's no, no modern from, doubt that no, the Piltdown like, Man was was a hoax. But from like the historical who done it perspective, we're never gonna know. I mean, you guys can have your theory, and you <laughs> and you guys can really. And then I and I'm with you there. I mean, yeah, he's probably the guy. But the problem is, is we will never truly know. For all we know, it could be Conan Doyle. You know? Now, hang on. I actually have a theory related to that. See? 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 All right. I have a theory. See, see, see. Right. Have a theory. It, wasn't, it wasn't directly Conan Doyle. It was Conan Doyle convincing the Cottingsley fairies to do it. Right. Oh, this is an interesting theory. What is, what is it you're drinking right now, Jim? Right? What oh, I am, I am drinking mostly water. Mostly oh, water. Okay. Go, 
But the thing about about Piltdown too, which is there's a broader issue here, and and I would will not be the first person to say this that in large measure the who done it part is a distraction from what's really important, and maybe we'll never know who it, who did it, and maybe who cares who did it. <laughs> Ultimately, it's all about why did people want to accept yes. a large-brained, simian-jawed ancestor as being at the root of the human evolutionary tree. Right. Why? It's not who did it, and, or even specifically why they did it. It's why so many scientists yeah. kind of left their skepticism at the door because they wanted this to be the human ancestor. And an and, English one. Yeah, of course, yeah. right. Now, I wanted, to, I wanted to kind of give a, a, a caveat, though. You had mentioned that many non-British scientists had been like, that's a hoax because what? sort of the argument that they're not biased towards it. And that's absolutely true. But there are cases where that goes the other way. The, the one that I am most familiar with is Russian linguist Yuri Norisov was the one who ultimately ended up being the, one of the most important voices who bro- or re- analysts who broke uh, Maya, who basically proved that Maya was uh, syllabic. Right. He was not believed for a long time. Because he was Russian, and it was during the depth of the Cold War, sure. and Jarek Thompson used that against him very openly because mm. there was this sort of thing where they'd be like, Soviet science, you know, Soviet science does this, Soviet science does that, right. and Soviet science in this case cracked the friggin' Maya code to some degree, mm-hmm. but that was used against him. So that can go that way, too. Well, sure. I think sure. that kind of comes back to what Ken was saying, though, because it's it was a political climate. That allowed oh, yeah. people oh, exactly. to believe that Piltdown was real. And, I mean, you, you're describing the same kind of thing. It's just yeah. more recent. No, yeah. And, and no, I'm not disagreeing with Ken at all. It's just right, right, sure. that can go both ways. But either way, it is being influenced by the context in which we find it, which is why I find this interesting because it's increasing what we know about the context. Oh, absolutely. The article itself is value is a valuable addition to what we know and but that's all it is right it doesn't overturn what we thought we knew it, it's not revolutionary it's not groundbreaking it's not going to make us it, it, look at the textbooks and what these guys say they are confirming what most te- textbooks already are saying it's be- it, of course it's wonderful to have definitive evidence but again we are not we're not all scratching our heads saying dawson who would have thunk it yeah. <laughs> no we all thunk that already yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a cadre of people who are probably the guy that did it. It's it's one of them, and Dawson's usually like like you said, he's usually top of the crop. Yeah, he's 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 he absolutely was involved. He he may have done it all by himself. He may have had the one of the arguments has always been, but was he capable of doing it? Where would he get an orangutan mandible? Um, where would he get p- parts of a human skull? But actually, at that time in the early 20th century in England, he might have had access to stuff like that to be able to craft the hoax. Well, and if he's friends with a whole bunch of naturalists, I mean, yeah, yeah. this stuff is a lot more common than people think. And I'm not surprised by that. I I wouldn't be shocked if somebody helped him. Uh, I I think he had a helper. I mean, that's my personal opinion on it. Yeah, I I don't know it as well. I wouldn't be shocked, though. But yeah, I think the bigger question, like Ken said, is why did this why did this spread and and that is in many ways um, it is more interesting it actually it yeah, actually yeah. really is yeah what's so interesting is that piltdown ultimately was the human ancestor that people wanted to have because of the the large brain very early on and the apparently simian characteristics below that large brain I mean, grafton elliot smith who was in who was tangentially involved who's a paleontologist from australia i mean even he's been accused because the piltdown was not wasn't discovered until Grafton Elliot Smith immigrated from Australia to Great Britain. So mere the mere fact that he after he got there, then the Piltdown hoax was perpetrated that maybe he was involved. But basically, what he said was that human human evolution that the earliest human ancestor was a, essentially a creature with a human brain who was basically a chimpanzee from the neck down. Yeah, which is exactly the opposite of what that it's the it's from the neck down that we become more human-like by fetal locomotion, uh, uh, upright posture, and it's the, the the brain that in fact evolves later on. I mean, well, I think there's was, yeah, mm-hmm. no. I was going to say I think that that's really fascinating because I think that's on purpose. I mean, people were freaking out about the idea of human evolution, exactly. so at least the idea that the brain evolves first gives us something 
when we start to realize that no, humanness isn't your brain, although it does become so. Right. Um, but the fact that you're up on two legs. Yeah. Well, that. Yeah. The, in fact, what the argument was was <laughs> what what's the mo in what what characteristic most clearly defines human beings? That must have been the characteristic that defined yeah. us first. You mean and thumbs? So, yeah, yeah, right. You, know, you say thumbs, but it's not bipedal locomotion. It's a large brain. It's great intelligence. So since that's the most different from our the, the ancestral form, it must have been evolving the longest. I thought yeah. it was and chins. I thought we were the only ones that had chins. We, uh, we have yeah. chins. I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> and, the, and, the, and, the, and the big brain is, is later, too. And then, of course, the other right. thing with Piltdown, we have to we we, sh we should definitely mention is that like Eric Thompson with the Maya, Eric Thompson basically knocking Norazov, locking Norazov out of the West, put Maya decipherment back probably a good 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. This did the exact same thing for African paleoanthropology because right. not long after, Raymond Dart identifies <clears throat> Australopithecus africanus, and that should have set off a revolution, but because of largely Piltdown, as well as, of course, like uh, racism against against Africa, right? right. Um, there was just like no, and th that got ignored. And so there really wasn't a huge amount of work in Africa until really after World War II. But you know what's really interesting there too, though, is that Davidson Black, who uh, actually worked as a graduate student in Grafton Elliott Smith's lab and actually worked on Piltdown, he's not the person who actually discovered. Jogodien, but he was the first Western scientist who kind yeah. of embraced that and got funding through the Rockefeller Foundation. Yeah. And in fact, he, he was in China expressly to find additional evidence related to a Piltdown like ancestor <laughs> and instead find something that absolutely contradicts it. But it was such a fa fantastic sight. I think that ultimately he wasn't really upset that what he was discovering, in fact, was not supportive of what his mentor uh, what his mentor's hypothesis was, but was showing something else entirely. So it was, it's ironic that it actually did inspire more work, people looking to find confirming evidence, something that was similar to Piltdown elsewhere in the world. But in fact, what that resulted in was them finding stuff that showed that Piltdown was the odd man out. I've got, I have a, a human evolution book that dates to the mid 1940s. And by that time, Piltdown really is the evolutionary odd man out. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff about, about Cro-Magnon, and there's a lot of stuff about the Neanderthals, and a lot of stuff about Java Man, and Piltdown is virtually a footnote in that discussion on human evolution, and basically saying, well, everything that we just talked to about in the main part of the text is all contradicted by this one fossil, and nobody knows exactly how to explain it. There was this recognition that even though at that point there was no definitive evidence that it had been a hoax, scientists realized it didn't fit with everything else that was being discovered and that that was a serious problem. Right. And, that, and that makes sense how they, how they expose it. Now, before we go to break, I do want to say, for those at home playing our drinking game, <laughs> Black was also the person who gave his name or his name was given to Gigantopithecus Blackie, uh -huh. the largest primate uh -huh. that ever lived and which has been turned by cryptozoologists – that's your basic Sasquatch, right? Into Sasquatch. So there's your drinking game, cryptozoology. When will Jeb mention it? Uh, and <laughs> after the break, we will continue to look at where science and the unknown kind of do their, do their thing. Exactly. <laughs> your cardiologist knows your heart, and your mom knows how to mend your heart. Your ophthalmologist helps you see, and your best friend makes you feel seen. A visit to your physical therapist can heal your shoulder, and a visit to your grandma can heal your soul. Your health is a journey you don't take alone. Just like the people around you, all of us at Kaiser Permanente work together to help care for all that is you. Learn more at kp.org, Kaiser Permanente, for all that is you. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. 
Hey everyone, and we are back, and we, before we move on to our next topic, I just want everyone to know that the original podcast where Ken and I talk about the Piltdown Man will be in the show notes, so you can catch up on that and compare it to the first half of this podcast, but we are now going to talk about Mars and the face that is upon Mars. The face on Mars! The Mars face, absolutely. Yes. I think everybody has seen what I could you could say is an iconic picture of what very strongly appears it's a black and white picture it very strongly appears to be a human looking face in relief on Mars and, and I remember when this the, the Viking expedition in 1976 correct mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely 19 yeah they landed on Mars in 1976 Viking 1 landed uh, Viking 1 there was an orbiter they spit mm-hmm. out a lander. The lander, um, um, the lander landed, and then the Viking One was taking photographs of the Martian surface. That's so. That's the, that's orbiter. the orbiter. Yeah, it's taking pictures of the of the Viking surface in order to find a a good place for Viking Two to land. The, the the thing before we talk about any of the specifics, I think the most important message here is that what you will hear regarding this and regarding so many other examples of in archaeology is that archaeologists or the government are keeping it secret. And we see this at Roswell, you see this in the in the Mars case, that something happened and the government is keeping it secret and it's brave, courageous, renegade thinkers who reveal the, the awful truth because the government doesn't want us to believe, doesn't want us to understand, doesn't want to, does, does not want us to know the truth. And this is an instance in which that is so demonstrably false, it's ridiculous. I have in front of me the press release <laughs> released by NASA on July the 31st, 1976. And this is, it's the JPL Viking press release, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, Viking News Center, Pasadena, California. And let me read, they released the photo, the photograph we're talking about, in which there is a, a, a apparently human-like face. They released the, cap, the photo. They didn't hide that photograph. They released it to the public with this caption. This picture is taken, this picture is one of many taken in the northern latitudes of Mars by the Viking 1 orbiter in search of a landing site for Viking 2. The picture shows eroded mesa-like landforms. The huge rock formation in the center, which resembles a human head, is formed by shadows giving the illusion of eyes, nose, and mouth. The feature is 1.5 kilometers across, with the sun angled at approximately 20 degrees. The speckled appearance of the image is due to bit errors emphasized by enlargement of the photo. The picture was taken on July 25 from a range of 1,872 kilometers. Viking 2 will arrive in Mars orbit next Saturday, that'll be August the 7th of 1976, with a landing scheduled for early September. You cannot say that the government was trying to hide this, that this was some sort of a, a that they were trying to, to keep the, keep it hidden that in fact there was some interesting geological features on Mars because they told everybody about it in a goddamn press release. If and anything, the photograph. if anything, they were like using the fact that it looks like a face to draw attention to their project. Exactly. So that's something that would fit to simply say there are a lot of eroded mesas in this photograph, probably with interest about two dozen geologists. But if yeah. you say, look at that thing in the middle, doesn't that look like a human face? But it's not. Here's what it actually is. But that's the thing that started all of this nonsense. But again, anyone who claims that this was that this was part of that there was a conspiracy to hide this from the public has it exactly wrong. This was announced by NASA. So in a way, they kind of did it to themselves then. Well, maybe they were naive and in not thinking that somebody would take that literally as, oh, my God. That looks like a human face. It must be a human face. Perhaps that was naive, but I think that what they were doing is exactly what Jeb said. That's some, that's interesting. You can't you can't not notice that in that image, and so they were simply pointing it out. Well, it's it's sensationalism from the time, and I mean, it, this particular kind, it is cool. I mean, that is neat. It's a cool trick of the light. It's a cool idea. You know, I mean, it's a neat freaking picture. Even today, it's a neat damn picture. Um, but I think they kind of were just victims of their own cleverness there, you know? Oh, but maybe so. Maybe so. But so they announced this and people are looking and saying, oh, that's really interesting. How interesting. And then Richard Hoagland. <laughs> now, 
Do you guys know Hoagland's background? I mean, I think no, actually, I, I actually really don't. You should fill us in. I know he talks about like somehow being involved in NASA, and that's literally all I know. Right. Well, Hoagland had um, a, a degree um, related to astronomy, not a PhD, and I don't think it was a master's degree. So he claims to have some um, uh, some credentials in the field. My understanding is basically what he was uh, trained to do was he ran a planetarium program, I think here in Massachusetts, up in Massachusetts, at the Springfield Planetarium. So it's a small planetarium. This guy knows how to, and back in the day, he knows how to turn on the Kodak carousel projectors to project like constellations and to run to run the big uh, projector that projects stars onto the uh, the planetarium dome. But he decides that, in fact, this is the greatest discovery, a significant, very important discovery that, in fact, is going to cause us to, you know, rewrite those proverbial textbooks. And he ends up putting together his his hypothesis is not simply that there is one carved monument on the face of on the surface of Mars, but that this is part of an ancient. 500,000 year old, how he comes up with that number is completely mysterious to me, 500,000 year old city, and he ends up co-authoring a book called City on the Edge of Forever. Which, he was a big Star Trek fan, I actually didn't know this, but he, actually I think I did know this, he was part of the letter writing campaign that got the first space shuttle, the one that never went into space, but was a test bed called the enterprise and they made a big deal about this and they had the the star trek actors appear with it it was again uh very very publicity minded and that of course is a play on the harlan uh, Harlan thank you harlan ellison thank you what's often considered the best episode of the original series the city on the edge of forever which, by the way, Harlan Ellison, I think, wanted to sue Roddenberry. Oh, he, they, well, they he did. Butchered. Did he sue them? Yeah. Uh, there was some. There was some settlement or something. Yes. Right. Yes. But yeah, no, he did. He did that. I don't know where he gets the five hundred thousand. It's part of the larger plains of Cydonia, which right. I'm, by the way, actually looking at right now on. Well, I, it's the program's Google Earth, but I'm actually looking at the Mars version of Google Earth, <laughs> and they label this as quote popular landform in Cydonia region. Can you actually yeah. see the face? You you can go there, yeah. If you if you if yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, so is this Mars put together as per the pictures from the Vikings from the Viking River? Well, it's it's much more recent imagery. Uh, but yeah, it's basically the equivalent of Google Earth, not quite as detailed, of course, but on Mars. Because it was my understanding when they went back and tried to fo- to relocate the um, the face when they sent the next set of uh, uh, observation out there, they weren't able to relocate it. Oh no, they find it. I mean, like they couldn't, exactly they couldn't recapture the face. Oh, so like they know where the landform. Oh is. yeah, the landform's there. It's just not a face anymore because it's got better imagery. Exactly. But of course, Hoagland and others then argue for years and years and years that like, oh well, this is a cover up, or they're modifying the data, or oh look, it actually is kind of like a face, just more eroded, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So there's there there actually is there, there's a, a much more recent uh, there's a Mars orbiter that went into orbit on Mars in 1996 with much better um, photographic equipment. And according to the NASA website, and maybe they're part of the disinformation campaign, in the original photograph where that, that, that they released, to give you an idea of the resolution of the photograph, one pixel on that photograph is 43 meters. That's 141 feet. So each pixel it's, is basically a football field and a half. You got it. In the most recent photographs of exactly the same feature where there is no face, one pixel is 1.56 meters, five feet across. Nice. That, that is tremendous. That, that, those photographs were taken in the mid-2000s. So obviously, anybody who – you don't have to know a lot about photography to know which photograph are you going to trust as being a more realistic depiction of what is being photographed. One and, in which a pixel is the size of a football field and a half, or one in which a pixel is less than the size of a human being. And not only that, if you look at the much more detailed imagery, you can see what some of the features were in the face one. And you're like, oh, that's what the eye thing sort of kind of was. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't look like that really anymore. But you're like, that's that. And that's that. I mean, it's clearly the same formation. Right. So, and then you can... 
they've right, gone exactly. out of their way to bring that forward so that people can yeah. see both the face and yeah. the formation that is the face. But there's still, like I was saying, there's still a lot of people out there who cry foul on this. And yes. it's yeah. bizarre. This, well, so I, I think one thing that might help is, is a historical. So, I mean, this be, this started to become, I mean, Hoagland was, was talking about this and others in sort of the, the, you know, kind of paranormal community and then on pop, pop culture. Right. In the late, I mean, he's talking about in the 70s, but even like in the late 80s, it starts to get worked into like television and movies in the early 90s. What is often routinely considered possibly the worst episode of the X Files is an episode <laughs> from the first season called Space, in which I shit you not, a ghost like version of the face on Mars attacks people, <laughs> like astronauts well, and whatnot. Oh my that, god, that, that show that is so ha- good. That could happen. That could happen. Yes. That could happen. No, it, it is. It is. It's like the giant of- green hand in the latest movie of Star Trek. So yeah, it, it's but it's kind of unwatchable. Like it really is unwatchable. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they make a big deal of it. And at one point, I think the astronaut's face like morphs into the face. Oh with her, yeah, uh, I have. CGI. I remember it now. Yeah, and and then it also it plays a huge role in um, one of those two. I want to say it's Mission to Mars. There was like two. Like long before The Martian, like the recent one that did well, there were like two big Mars movies like Red Planet and Mission to Mars. I think it's Mission to Mars where they basically find sort of stereotypical aliens and alien technology and whatnot and sort of ancient aliens in essence inside the face or something like that on Mars. A really weird thing that a lot of ufologists like to point out and a lot of people on this is that – and I sent you guys the link in the sidebar. In 1950 – I think it's six – Jack Kirby, the very – 1958, the very famous uh, comics creator and artist actually did a comic story about a face on Mars called The Face on Mars with astronauts exploring this thing. And the rest of it doesn't really go there. But Kirby works with a lot of ancient alien stuff. He – a lot of his creations that became sort of – uh, canonical or quasi canonical for Marvel and DC were very ancient aliens and Von Daniken aligned is well, maybe the best. If a comic it. book from 20 years prior says that there's a face on Mars, then that that's good enough for me. Yeah. I mean, you'll find people in that community that are talking about Kirby, like being in touch with like, you know, occult forces and whatnot and foreseeing what would come or having secret Ooh. knowledge. Now, uh-huh. Jeb, just to let people know that, that giant faces are not seen only on Mars, in the book that you and Dave Anderson edited, in the, the, uh, the symposium that we that you and I and Dave and a bunch of other folks participated at the SAAs in 2012, uh-huh. is the tell, – tell folks about the giant head in, is in Australia. I think. Well, I may not go into it in too much detail because we may actually be getting Dennis oh, Gojak right. on the show. Gotcha. But right. yeah, but he has a similar thing. Uh, with a face in Australia, and the fascinating thing there is less the face, and again, if we have him on, but what happened when archaeologists right. were mm-hmm. asked about the face in Australia, but we may leave that one alone, but it's yeah, another one, fine. and there are plenty of other ones, I mean, there's there's like, I've seen people point at like gigantic, I mean, literally a third of the planet size, or maybe not a third, but like a fifth of the planet size, formations in the Pacific, or massive formations in North America. There, there, that okay, I, know. I got both of you topped. I used oh, yeah? to have a guy who would send me emails, and he stopped recently, who would, from what I can tell from the pictures, he has taken a picture of a globe, like you would have sit on your table and, and I'm, would point I'm to things. Going, I am no, going no, to no, no, no. I'm going to hate whatever you're saying. That's all I'm saying. Just keep going. It from the, From the look of the picture, it looks like he has taken a picture of the globe with like a camera, like a cell phone, and then blown that picture up millions of times in order to find evidence on the ocean floors as predicted as shown by these 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 uh, globes as evidence that the sphinx abu sin and the pyramids are all actually natural formations they are not man-made structures well that's interesting that goes the other way it's usually Good usually God, we're dealing yeah. with like mountains turning exactly. into yeah. Wow! I yeah, like I know it. It really <laughs> threw me for a loop because I was like, I because I, I had what? to talk to him a little bit to completely figure out what he was trying That's to say. Great. But his his theory is is that all all of these giant structures that have been built in prehistory are not actually man made. They are naturally occurring structures, and his evidence for that 
are these massively blown up pictures of his <laughs> desk globe that he's taking that with his cell phone. That is – that is A, that's kind of creative. I kind of like it. It's different. Yeah, it, goes it is. It's very different and I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. And and it, secondly, it reminds me you, – you, you've all heard of the Ig Nobel Awards? <laughs> yes. yes. Like the, the improbable <laughs> science or whatever it is where they like have this – I, I had like a joke book at one point that was that was published by them, and it was a bunch of like faux articles, scientific articles. And the one I remember liking the most was an article on Xerox microscopy. Yep. In which you would Xerox a thing, and then oh. you would explode <laughs> it up to sixteen hundred percent, and you would Xerox the the, the copy of the thing, mm -hmm. and you would repeat ad necessarium until you got the thing that you were looking for. Yeah, that was microscopy. Yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much what you're describing. Yeah. If this guy republishes it, he needs to cite that article. I, you know, <laughs> this guy, like, I kind of miss him, but at the same time, he would send me like 14 emails all at once, and they were kind of, yeah. I don't know if English wasn't his first language or what. And I appreciated them, but at the same time, it got it got it got a little hard to get through. Yeah, no, that's it, it, it's it's kind of an example of how you can take skepticism too far. He's even skeptical that the Sphinx was built by people I, and can prove that it wasn't. That's, that's it was, astonishing. You know, the funny part is, is he would find, he really would find shapes that did sort of, if you squinted, look like the things he was claiming they were. And so, like, it wasn't like it was just kind of a cloud thing. It's like there, there, he would definitely find things that looked like a face profile or looked like did a person it, did holding it, things. Did it make or, you doubt your sanity? No. Did it like unmoor you from from like uh, like stable tethers of reality? I had to pinch myself at one point because I was kind of like, maybe I'm dreaming. Maybe everything in the world is really. Maybe we've never built anything, and even so that's skyscrapers what, are see? just that's, giant. That's ant hills. Cool. Well, it's <laughs> we're all we're all living in a computer simulation anyway. This so is also true. Computer. This is also true. Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, that speaking speaking of, I mean, we're not going to get into this because that's not our thing. But <laughs> speaking of like things you see in the press that people talk about all the time. That's one of my pet peeves is the uh, is the is the simulation hypothesis. I mean, right. I get I get the underpinning, but just really, I just hope whoever's running this particular game of Sims is not like me, um, <laughs> because we will all have very good lives otherwise. It'll be very yeah. short. All right, let's go to break real quick, and when we come back, we're gonna tie archaeology back to the face on Mars. Soupcast is just the audio from select episodes at the YouTube channel of Archaeosoup Productions. Mr. Soup brings you a clear understanding of the past in order to truly understand the world around us. Check out Soupcast at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com forward slash Soupcast. Now let's get back to the show. At Kroger Pharmacy, care is what's most convenient for you. Care is being here when you need us. We're open evenings and weekends. Care is helping you save more. Most insurance plans and discount cards are accepted at your local Kroger Pharmacy. Care is saving you time by managing your prescriptions online. You can request refills, check order status, and more. Care is convenience that works for everyone. Kroger Health, a world of care is in store. Services and availability vary by location. Age and other restrictions may apply. For coverage, consult your health insurance company. Visit the pharmacy or our site for details. Your cardiologist knows your heart, and your mom knows how to mend your heart. Your ophthalmologist helps you see, and your best friend makes you feel seen. A visit to your physical therapist can heal your shoulder, and a visit to your grandma can heal your soul. Your health is a journey you don't take alone. Just like the people around you, all of us at Kaiser Permanente work together to help care for all that is you. Learn more at kp.org, Kaiser Permanente, for all that is you. Hey everyone, and we are back, and we are talking about the face on Mars and similar phenomena as it occurs here on our own planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we briefly mentioned in the, in the previous set the, um, the the giant head in Australia, and let's do absolutely. There's a Dennis Dennis Gojak. We Dennis Gojak, yes, with him. absolutely. But yeah, we've, we've we've been in touch with him. All right, and one of the better known ones, at least I students will come up to me and say, "What about this?" Is usually called the giant Indian head of Alberta, and it's this spectacular image from Google Earth of what appears to be. A kind of stereotypical Native American in profile, wearing a headdress. It looks a lot like the old, buff, the old um, Indian head nickel. He's 
looking west. The weird thing is, he's got this strange hairdo or, or feathered the, headdress. The, and, the name on Wikipedia is the Badlands Guardian. That's what they're calling it. Uh, well, there you go. That's a good name. And what's really interesting is apparently there actually is a wellhead right where his ear would be. And so people have pointed out that with the wellhead and the road coming out of that wellhead, it looks like he's wearing earbuds with his iPhone. Nice. Yeah. And geologists have looked at this and said, look, you, if, depending on the angle, depending on, the, on the, the, the angle of the sun, depending on the angle of the photograph, you can see these all over the Badlands. And in fact, I think there's another one that I haven't yet seen. It's the giant bunny rabbit <laughs> of, of the, the Badlands. Wow. And you look at it and you go, well, this is, this is what pareidolia is all about. It's about seeing, it's about our brains. We're pattern seeking machines and we, we, we see an image that is not actually an Indian head or a bunny rabbit or whatever, or, or, or a giant head on Mars. And our, our brains kind of fill in the, the gaps and we, we perceive something that isn't actually there. It's an incredibly impressive image, I have to admit that. But yeah. it's, it is, it's, it's hundreds of miles across, and it, it certainly isn't an artificial thing. It's, it's this wonderful combination of erosion and our brain's ability, maybe our brain's necessity of finding patterns where, in fact, there aren't any. But it's clearly, it's clearly but, evidence that aliens came here trying to contact us. But it, the bizarre thing in all of these cases, the same is true with Nazca, which are those are genuine giant geoglyphs. It is, which is if you if you accept this this notion that these are gigantic uh, works of, of of construction or art by extraterrestrial aliens, why the fuck are they making these things? Why in NASCAR are they making giant spiders and hummingbirds? And, and those are those actually are spiders and hummingbirds. Yes. Or why were they why are they carving a giant Native American? Head in profile in the Badlands of Alberta. What? Do what not is the question <laughs> the extraterrestrial spiders. Never uh, question the extraterrestrial spiders. The spiders. Are we talking about the spiders from Mars? Uh, don't saying, question them. Don't at question all them. I'm saying. But right. okay, so bringing this back around to Mars, though, how? Hoagland is a really interesting character. Are you guys with Hoagland? Has long claimed. That his that the, the the plaque that went on the Voyager one that shows the two people standing and a, a little it's a, a it's a gold it's a gold plaque so it will not erode and it's right. a record and it, right that Hoagland says that was his idea I have Hoagland's, heard that Hoagland I have heard says that. he told Carl Sagan about this he very often presents his relationship with Carl Sagan and apparently they they were in. In, in a number of cases, they were in the same room at the same time. And Hoagland presents that as that he and Carl were, were friends and communicated frequently, and that this was his idea. And that Carl Sagan ran with it and took, took credit with it, which is okay because it was more accepted with Carl having said it. Um, there's, a, there's a wonderful book called Captured by Aliens by Joel Achenbach, who I think was yes. a journalist. And I, I enjoyed the book very much. I thought it was really well written. And he talks about I guess interviewing Hoagland after the uh, the original discussion of the Mars face, right? And and there's the 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 reveal that there's a giant head on Mars. Um, ultimately, NASA did actually go back in and and intentionally rephotograph that head as a as a result of all the publicity. And apparently, it was Carl Sagan. Who convinced NASA this would be a really good idea? It's a good, it's a teachable moment. Show people that if we rephotograph it at a different angle, higher resolution, that that image really does disappear. That the image isn't actually there. Hoagland says, at least according to Achenbach, that that, it, that again that that was his idea. And if you look at the details, he says, well, he saw Sagan at some conference, some public conference. And that he made eye contact with Sagan. He never says, I told Carl that they ought to rephotograph it. But Carl, but he says, Carl knew this was my idea. And I kind of made eye contact with him. And Carl looked at me and kind of simply nodded. And he recognized, hopefully he recognized this was Carl telling him, yeah, I'm going to do that. That's a really good idea. So he's yeah. also telepathic? Uh, why not? Well, why exactly, not? exactly. <laughs> exactly. Says, why not? By the way, the book, 
the Monuments of Mars, the city on the edge of forever, is now in its fifth edition. You can buy the fifth edition uh, on Amazon. I remember as a, not a kid, but like as as a I don't know maybe teenager or something. I remember seeing TV ads for that online, not online on, right? on, on, on television. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was like they sort of had that kind of like buy it on tv like this was clearly not from a big corporation it was sort of right okay all right but yeah. they were no they were on like, like television. The dianetics commercials kind of yeah, yeah. i still remember so, those commercials so lower lower budget than that but wow. yes yeah no they really i do remember distinctly really? seeing them often late at night but not always yeah. That, that's similar. Um, growing up in New York, there were a lot of commercials on the local stations. Yeah, I remember it may have been series. the local New York, yeah, like either yeah. PIX or WOR. I think it was one of those two. But, but I, I remember that what some guy who nobody had ever heard of, his name was Peter Lemongello, believe it or not, apparently decided that, that he could sell a lot of records by by, by singing a lot of uh, doing a lot of covers of popular songs and then selling it on TV. Uh, but presenting it as if, well, of course, you know who Peter Lemangelo is, and these are many of the songs that he made famous. Apparently, he sold a lot of records because people said, well, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I recognize this guy. That's and funny. He had never made a record before. He did it all himself. He didn't have a, a record contract with with a, with a record a, a company, but he just said, figured, you know, if it's on TV and it's on an ad, people will buy it, and apparently yeah. they did. Yeah. Um, so we, you know, it's 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 fish in a barrel, right? We are debunking the Mars face. That's really easy. The question I would like to ask now, and I want to present it to Jeff, because this is, this is, you know, he's done the research. How it's weird this... shit, so I'm, I should be and, answering. Right. Yes. There you go. And you can, you can, you can put that in your, your dossier when you're up for promotion. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So the deal is, Jeb, how did this fit in to the greater world of UFO aficionados in the 1970s and 1980s. Brace this? Was um, this something they accepted or, or, or was it something they... How did it's they interesting. It's interesting because, so the, I, don't, I don't know about Embrace, but so there's a couple of places there. First of all, uh, kind of like almost working backwards as, as, as an archaeologist, you know, we, we work from the surface down. You know, Hoagland has been a huge figure on Coast to Coast AM. Like he's right. all, he often was on Coast to Coast AM. The big, huge AM radio paranormal, Art Bell, George Norrie, kind of the, the sort of successors to uh, Long John Nebel, who kind of pioneered the paranormal radio thing in the 50s and 60s. So he was so he was always promoting this and, and, and pushing other ideas and like seeing, you know, oh, we, we hit it with this and we did this mathematics and it gets all usually very arcane. Right. Um, you find a lot now, more than I think you used to, people looking at Mars and other things and seeing like spires. I mean, you know, there's like all these these particularly like not commonly known ideas that like oh the moon is hollow and artificial and it's got a giant spire that captures human souls when they die and uses them for things it does uh, yeah we'll talk about that another time but uh <laughs> or, or you know no there's, there's all these ideas kind of tied to john lear that goes back to john lear in the 1980s who was very deeply involved in all the area 51 business yeah all, all these strange ideas about about mars and i've seen like videos that are clearly using parts of video games but that are trying to argue that they are parts right. of uh, okay. of footage of secret bases on the moon and, and, and stuff like mm -hmm. that. Um, awesome. And and so that's become not – I wouldn't say mainstream, but if you go into like, again, YouTube and you start looking up this stuff, you will quickly run into these claims of, you know, huge amounts of – you know, extraterrestrial or demonic or Nephilim or Anunnaki or whatever constructions on Mars, on, on you know, the moon, etc. Right. So now we go further back. In the 1990s, these ideas were actually very popular. They were very popular. There's, you know, there's, there's bands named after this, you know, the Knights of Sidonia. There's, there's movies based. We were talking about this earlier. Right. And that had metastasized into the larger pop culture and in sort of kind of ufology and all that i think some people looked at it and went eh, yeah no it's just a it's a shape and others went the other way go back further i think what this is part of and we've talked about this before but there is this kind of constant tug back and forth between are these topics more physically scientific or are these topics more spiritual occult paranormal whatever word you want to right. use and mm -hmm. if you all are playing our game you know it's like the 
is Bigfoot Gigantopithecus is blackie or is it, you know, a thought form or is it a forest spirit or something like that? And in ufology in particular, in the 1960s and early 70s, following the counterculture, following, you know, all of these, these transformations and questioning of sort of materiality in the West, mm -hmm. uh, you had people saying, oh, well, these are all very metaphysical. There was a backlash to that. I mean, around the same time, you start to see things like Happy Days on TV, and you start to see certain kinds of politics emerging that are kind of harkening back to the 1950s is when you start to see crash saucer legends of conspiracies and nuts and bolts spacecraft and dead bodies and, and physical traces and all of that rather than Jacques Vallée or John Keel talking about mystical thought forms or hyperdimensional ultra terrestrials and all that and i think the far the mars face initially kind of goes along with the spacecraft space exploration right NASA, yeah, okay. conspiracy i think it fits really nicely into that so i don't think it was ever a everybody believed it in those communities but it mm -hmm. kind of went along and now now that the meme has been planted of extraterrestrial stuff we should see in orbit and beyond orbit then it gets turned into whatever the flavor of the month is you know a soul sucking moon i am not making that up mm -hmm. um and it's now adaptable like all these things are like so many of the things we right. talk about they start in one place but then they just kind of follow the winds hmm. somebody somebody just sent me a video i have no idea how old it is um of the if it's a woman crawling out of a well don't watch it <laughs> no, <laughs> too no. late it's it, it was on the moon, and it's a smokestack on the moon with yeah. with puffs of smoke coming out of it. But then it kind of shape shifts. So this is apparently these are extraterrestrials mining the moon, mining minerals on the moon. Um, well, extraterrestrials, or the, the the big du jour one now, and especially since the crash in two thousand eight, is the breakaway civilization. The idea of there's, you know, the, the, the true elites have all gone underground and have all left Earth or have all gone into underground bases and they're leaving the less of us to rot while they, like, take all of our wealth. And, uh, you know, they have a super science and they've got, you know, they've got us all under control. And it's it's clearly a sort of hyper reflection, like a, like a, a metaphor for the fact that there has been a huge change in, in wealth distribution in, in uh -huh. the West. But the real elite are not on the freaking moon. They, you know, have have expensive. You know where they are. Yeah. They have expensive yeah. pads in London and in Manhattan and in Chicago and in well, Singapore. And why Tokyo would they go to Beijing. Mars? Why would they go anywhere? I mean, are they also taking their servants along? Do they? Do people think that the the elite are like living with robot servants with food replicators no. in the lap of luxury in the center when, of the moon? Somewhat, but when you said servants, that actually got to it. So this is. Are either of you familiar with Alternative 3? This kind of ties in, actually. No. No. Oh, my God. If, oh if, my if, God. You, if you tell us about this, do you have to, like, lock us away? Or is it okay for us to know this? Uh, so Alternative 3 was a television program uh, in the UK in 1977, right around the time we're working, right around the time we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And it was shown on a show. It was, it was, it was shown in a, sh in, in, a, in a format that already existed, uh, like, a, like a news program. And it was about the brain drain. Now, do you all know what, what does brain drain mean to you all? That's when you have highly educated people leaving an area after getting their education. Yeah. yeah. Like, folks from India come to the United States. It's a brain drain. The, the best and the brightest go elsewhere. Because the money is somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. exactly. Right. And so the UK, because it did not have a really great economy in the 1970s, was very concerned about the brain drain. So... This was going to air, this thing called Alternative 3, uh, in, on April 1, 1977, also known as April 1st, also known as you got it, yeah. April okay. Fool's April Day, Fool's of course. Day. Yes. And so they did this thing, and it's sort of like a 60 Minutes kind of show, uh, and front or front line, whatever you want to call it. And they are doing this presentation, and it's not just the, they start with the brain drain. Like, it's just like, we're investigating the brain drain. And then they run across, like, not just, oh, they went to America, but people, like, slamming doors in their face because, like, so-and-so scientist has disappeared. Mm -hmm. And they start finding more and more scientists appear. And then they start talking to an American astronaut and scientists and all of that. And basically what the title refers to is they get some professor to talk 
that uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, there was a meeting of all the world's elites where they realized <laughs> that the earth was going to become uninhabitable due to global warming and other things. And this is why this has been revived. And there were three alternatives. And I forget what all of them were, but one was to literally use, I think, nuclear bombs to blow holes in the atmosphere to let uh, carbon dioxide out. The, the second alternative yes, was – yeah. Again, remember this is a parody. Right. The second one was uh, going underground. The third one was a secret space program. And so they keep going and they eventually get this videotape and other people are disappearing. And then they finally decode the, 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 the videotape. And it's the first landing on Mars in 1961, a manned planetary landing on Mars. So this whole super secret space program. And there's – Life, like there's literally things moving, mm -hmm. like it's, it's it's got greenery, and so the whole so everything's a lie. And then the <laughs> my my favorite part is the the presenter is standing in the studio, he's being you know, all like super serious British documentary pr uh, uh, presenter, and he has a flat a flat map of the moon, and he has on there Soviet and American flags showing where the moon landings are. Uh -huh. And he's like, oh, there's one here, there's one here in the senior ability. But this is the side that faces us. We've recently been able to determine all the landings on the dark side of the moon. And he flips this thing around on a swivel, and there's like 400 flags. <laughs> and so the idea is that there's like this super secret space right. program and that they have uncovered it. Now, the problem was this was supposed to air on April 1st. Now, I still yeah. wouldn't air that on April 1st because, I mean, really? <laughs> but, right. but there was a scheduling problem. And it actually aired some two weeks later. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, nobody, put, wow. nobody put it together. Yeah. And so people lost their minds. And uh. so Alternative 3 has been stuck in sort of conspiracy. It, it aired on 20 June. Not even close to April 1st. <laughs> not even a little bit. Yeah. So, so it's stuck in there. It's stuck in this whole idea of of this breakaway civilization and that i'm not saying that's why this exists mm -hmm. but it has continued to kind of expand and so once these ideas are out there this is an idea we've, we've talked about before sure. they will start to conform to whatever however they fit and they they do they do end up with you know developing a life all on their own so that it, it gives you pause when when you're producing some creative funny sarcastic pa or parody that at some point your intent may be divorced from what pe oh, yeah. how, how people interpret it. I mean, this is like um, what is it the the the, under, the ancient underground city in is it St. Louis? Yeah, I think it's supposed to be under St. Louis, and uh, I think it was late nineteenth, early twentieth century, and we. Within, oh, people went nuts. Oh my God, there's this evidence of some ancient underground city. And then it was within a couple of weeks, the editor of the newspaper said, I, I made that all up. Calm down. It was just a parody. You can go online today, a hundred years later, and still see people say, talking yep. about this hidden archaeological site that they don't want you to know about. Yeah. And, well, Jeb and I have covered this kind of thing before on an earlier podcast, this whole concept of these mockumentaries that are just taken completely out of context because they're not given good context when they're aired. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And honestly, I have to say, it's one of the things that I balance. I mean, so we recently did the Hexam Heads. Now, they're decently known in certain circles, but they're not crazily well known. No. They're fascinating. They, they tell us something about archaeology. Should we have talked about them? <laughs> and I mean, I mean, it, 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 we could say that, like, but I, I honestly wonder sometimes if you know, if it's like, if it's not that well known, <laughs> just let it go. And Don't I bring really it do. Up. Yeah, I really kind of, but then, but then I disagree with that. I, 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 I agree and I disagree because at the end of the day, because these things always come roaring back, and this is something we've seen time and again. Is that since they're out there, they, they do. Well, guys, let's our last few minutes. What are our final thoughts on? giant heads and Indian heads <laughs> and the media in general. I, I don't excavate into them. That just seems like a terrible, terrible plan. <laughs> no. If we ever These, make it to Mars, it's the first thing well, I'm Well, I think it's fascinating. We opened up with all the problems with the media. We have well-intentioned scientific stories 
that get blown out of proportion. Right. What's the what's the face on Mars? A well-intentioned scientific story that got blown out of proportion. I think we did a fine job of connecting yes. our two topics today. <laughs> And actually, I don't know that we hadn't planned that way. Yes, yes, actually, we had. We did, right, Ken. Shush. I guess you guys have to let me in on the plan, <laughs> but that's fine. Ken, what are your final but thoughts on all this? Well, I, mean, I think that, that, that ultimately we have, there are a number of threads here. One thread is the debunking thread, which is, look, here's what we know about the geology of Mars. Here's what we know about the history of Mars. There isn't any goddamn giant head on Mars. But the other thread, the, and, and equally important, maybe more important, is why do people want to embrace these kinds of ideas? Why why do they, again, suspend their disbelief and look at a grainy photograph and say, oh, my God, this changes everything we know about the universe, about about the development of life, maybe about the evolution of, of humanity? Why? And that's that's an, an incredibly important question. Why do people want to believe these things? I mean, we, we talked about that with Pilton. Why did people want to believe what in hindsight appears to be a clumsy hoax? Why do people want to believe uh, the implications drawn by some people uh, based on a grainy, very ro- low resolution photograph? And that's an issue that not just archaeologists, but all scientists have to deal with. Well, I think it comes back to something that one of our guests on a lot of one of our earlier shows said, and it's it matches the history that people want to believe. And I think that's what it comes down to. It's they see these things, they're exciting, they're wonderful, and it matches what they feel like that history and prehistory and all of that should look like to them. And so it's easy for them to believe. Well, I mean, it's like with, with Piltdown, it's like, well, if if we have to have evolved, we're not happy about that, but if we have to evolve, I'm glad that we evolved as large, bra- that the large brain was what first distinguished us from Large the, brain from other Europeans. You're, you're a large brain Englishman. Yeah. And in the case of, of the Mars face, maybe it's, wow, the universe is cold and dark. The Earth is not at the center of that universe, but maybe we have a connection to an incredibly sophisticated ancient civilization on another planet, and that changes how we view ourselves. And, and to, so it's, mm-hmm. yeah, go ahead. Well, and to echo when we had April Bisa on, there's that there's that element. When you guys were talking about grainy photos, all I could think of is that people like to look into grainy photos and find what other people have not found. Yep. That 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 this element of I am discovering. Oh sure! Oh absolutely. And right. If you look, if you if you if you Google, you will find that somebody somewhere has taken one of the updated uh, uh, photographs or images of the face on Mars and has superimposed the face of Elvis Presley yeah. over it. Yeah. <laughs> and so obviously it's Elvis on Mars. Um, and then I've also seen people who who claim that the face on Mars bears a striking resemblance to the face of Jesus on the Shroud of Turin. Sure. Um, there's also somebody who says that you know it looks um, astonishing, astonishingly like um, some Hindu monkey deity. Um, so it's like anything else in sure. Paradise. Reminds me of Zardoz, exactly yeah, right? <laughs> there you Reminds go. me of Zardoz, but I don't really like to think about Zardoz because that involves Sean Connery in a bikini. Mm. Which it was is worth it at really the time. Better, better left. Yeah. Unimagined. I think that's the worst place to end the show, but I think that's. But it is where we're ending the show. Sean Sean Connery Connery in a bikini, in a red leather bikini. Yep. Here's the deal, Sarah. If you can find an image, if you find a photograph of that, you have to include that in the show notes. I'm doing it. All right, guys. Thank you very much for calling and talking with us today. Thank you. Fantastic, Sarah. All right. Good talking to you, Jeff. Finding a wall and high vibing. Thanks for listening. We hope you've enjoyed what you've heard. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Remember to rate and like us wherever you listen. Be sure to comment on this episode and share us with your friends. You can contact us with your questions, comments, or angry email at archiefantasies at gmail.com or leave a comment on the show page. Show notes and downloads can be found at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com slash archiefantasies. You can also follow the blog at archiefantasies.com and follow us on Twitter at archiefantasies. Music was provided by Archaeosuit Productions.
This show is part of the Archaeology Podcast Network and is produced by Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle. Thanks again for listening. Are you happy? Do you get it now? Do you get it? Honestly. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth Shopping Kroger, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make Shopping Kroger worth it every time. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply.